think most of us can think of a time when somebody didn't live up to our expectations or we thought, you know, maybe uh, uh, somebody we knew might, might do something great in their life and they just didn't quite make that expectation. And we see that certainly with high profile people, politicians and sports figures and so forth. And um, like, think about how that felt when you realize, you know, this person's just not who I thought it was, thought they were. And bring that up because this is uh, a realization that happened to Jesus on his final week. People had this great expectation of him. And his final week began with a great procession with great expectations. So the Sunday before Easter is known as Palm Sunday. And uh, it's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. We know this is the triumphal entry. Certainly you've heard this story, haven't you? Yes. How about you kids? You heard this story? Well, if you haven't, you will today. See, in Jesus' time, the day we call Easter was the day the Jews celebrated Passover. And the Passover celebration went way back in time to Moses' day as one of the plagues that was brought on the Egyptians um, was uh, angel of death coming and, and taking away the firstborn. And so the Jews, the Jewish people, put, uh, kill the lamb, and they put the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over them. And so for many generations, they'd celebrated Passover every year uh, in, in memorial of that. And there were certain religious festivals that were celebrated in the city of Jerusalem. Passover was one of them. There was also a cultural expectation to arrive in Jerusalem seven days early for a celebration. The reason for that is it took seven days to become ceremonially clean if you somehow became unclean. And so they would get there early. They would get there seven days early. So this is the background. So Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So here it is, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. I want you to imagine this scene as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. There's something that we don't really readily understand about the significance of these palm leaves is all these people that were coming to Jerusalem, hundreds and hundreds of them made these temporary shelters and covered them in palm leaves. And, and so they're camped along the road and man, it, you would think that with all the people there, somebody would have taken a video of this, but they didn't. And so I'll have to try to describe it to you. You got cooking fires. You can smell the cooking fires. There's, there's children playing their games. There's a lot of busyness as they're preparing for the upcoming Passover meal. Not to mention, they got to eat too during that time. Lots of activity going on and and. As far as you can see, they're just shelter after shelter. And uh, the, the local uh, trees would have been nearly stripped bare just to make these temporary shelters. 
and the roads, dusty roads, and they were worse than our B surface roads here. And partly what made them worse is animals shared them as well without street sweepers. And so it was uh, a lot of activity, a lot of sights, a lot of smells going on. Now Jesus had been to Jerusalem several times before at Passover, but this time he rode in on a donkey while his followers cheered for him. And as he grew closer to the city, people began to shout louder and louder. And uh, so much so that the people in the city started hearing it. And then they started covering the ground for him to walk on, covering this dirty ground. And they were using palm leaves. And some of them were even using their own clothing. Now think about this. Their clothes before modern day manufacturing took days to make one article of clothing. They were literally laying some of their most valuable possessions down for Jesus to write in on. And something that kind of caught my eye, this donkey that he rode in on, never been ridden before, has all this commotion going on. And it didn't get spooked. I don't know if you've ever ridden a, a horse that had not been ridden before, but can't say for a donkey. I can tell you a horse sure wasn't going to put up for that kind of commotion. But there's a, here's a truth here. When we are truly being used of Christ, we have peace that passes understanding. And in this case, it was true for this character, this donkey, which is just a sub-character, by the way. It's, it's mentioned in all four Gospels, so sometimes we put a little too much emphasis on the donkey. But see, there was a symbolism that the original readers would have understood, the original hearers of this. First, the donkey fulfilled a prophecy found in Zechariah 8, or 9, rather. But see, also in ancient times, a king of war would ride a horse, while a king of peace would ride a donkey. And here's where things initially start getting a little different than what was expected, because the people of Israel had great expectations that a king would arise to free them from the Romans. I mean, they weren't all bad, the Romans, other than the uh, you know, maybe uh, the oppressive way they treated them or the unfair tax system or, um, you know, they uh, might have had those things against the Romans, I suppose. But, but also, because of the way they were treated, there were occasional short-lived uprisings. And the, the Romans were very good at quelling these uprisings in a hurry. But what the people wanted and expected was a warrior king. That, that was the expectation. And the crowds paid homage to what they expected as a warrior king by laying down palm branches and even articles of clothing. And they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Do you know what Hosanna means? Anybody know? No? What's that? Hooray. Hooray? Yeah, sort of. It's a, it's a term of adoration and respect, but it also means save us. So they were literally praising Jesus and asking him to save them simultaneously. And by calling Jesus the son of David, the crowds... We're comparing him to a great king in, in Jewish history. With, and so they had this great exuberance. There was a lot of excitement. Uh, shouted out for a king like David that would rule with power, wisdom, and strength. But if you look closer, you'll find it was the common folk that were praising Jesus. Religious leaders had no part in that. Luke 19, 37 through 40 says, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Many Bible scholars admit that Palm Sunday leaves us with some confusion considering what happens a few days later. In a short time, Jesus had gone from hero to zero. What happened from Sunday to Friday that changed the crowd's minds so much? Did you ever listen to Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story? I used to love listening to that on the radio. To understand what happened that changed Jesus' reputation so quickly, we need to use both scripture and historical reference. Looking at historical evidence, we find there were two processions into Jerusalem, most likely the, the day Jesus rode in on a donkey. There were two processions with one big decision. Paraphrasing from the book the last week, two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. One was a peasant procession, the other an imperial procession. From the east, Joseph, Jesus rode a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. Jesus was from the peasant village Nazareth. His message was about the kingdom of God, and his followers came from the peasant class. See, Jesus' procession was proclaiming the kingdom of God, but on the other side of the city from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial and cavalry and, and soldiers. Pilate's procession proclaimed the power of empire. This was, in their day, a magnificent military parade. The two processions embody the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus' crucifixion. See, Pilate's military procession, his big parade, was a demonstration of both Roman imperial power and Roman imperial theology. In Roman theology, Caesar was considered to be the son of God. Now that's an interesting thing when we start to realize there's, there's two very uh, uh, different things going on. The mission of the troops with Pilate was to reinforce the Roman garrison. This was in the event of an uprising. So it was practice that the governor would enter into Jerusalem at times of festivals in case any trouble breaks out. Now, man, if I... I don't know if you can really envision what this must have looked like. Roman soldiers, the strongest, best trained military in the world at that time. They had the best armor. They, had, they only knew how to fight forward. They could never retreat. They were an impressive elite group of soldiers here. So as they entered in, so they entered in, their, their leather armor, their, their gold eagles up on staff, their, uh, they would have been shined up, walking in perfect unison. It would have been possibly awe-inspiring, possibly terrifying, certainly a sight to behold. And this was this procession coming in on the other side of Jerusalem.
On the Sunday of the week of Passover in 30 AD, the crowds excitedly cheered for Jesus while the Romans watched with curiosity. They're looking for a possible uprising, and so they, he would have had their attention with all the noise going on. But on Friday the same week, the Romans had no concern about Jesus, and the Jews wanted him dead. Here's what we know of the events that week. So Sunday, Jesus and his disciples make a two-mile journey to Jerusalem from Bethany. This is what we're celebrating today. This is, that's what we call Palm Sunday. On Monday, he argues with the chief priests, and he protests, <laughs> protests financial transactions in the, in the temple. No, he made a whip, and he drove out the money changers. Look at this from the eyes of the Roman soldiers. It's like, that guy is uh, causing division amongst the Jews. All they understood in military life was unity, and they see Jesus going in and, and arguing with the temple leaders and, and running people out with a whip. The Romans are already like, they don't see much of a leader there. And uh, Tuesday, Jesus predicts and announces the date of his execution. Again, he debates with religious leaders and responds to questions about the greatest commandment. But also on Tuesday, Judas, who you may or may not know this, he actually was the money keeper of Jesus' disciples. He contracts to betray Jesus. He makes an arrangement with them for 30 pieces of silver. On Wednesday, Jesus warns against religious leaders, calling them hypocrites and snakes. From Mount of Olives, Jesus mourns Jerusalem's rejection and pending destruction. And then on Thursday, he has the Last Supper with the disciples. And Thursday into Friday is the events of the Garden of Gethsemane, followed by Jesus' arrest, abuse, imprisonment, and execution. So the very same crowds that were cheering for Jesus as he entered Jerusalem would have noticed an increase in Roman soldiers in the city. So this is, this is what's kind of going on. They have so much happening and they're like, you got all these Roman soldiers here. This is getting a little tense. Had to be a very tense situation. Some in the crowds, the Jewish crowds, would have been eagerly anticipating a military king to rise up and defeat the Romans. Others would have been terrified at the thought of conflict breaking out. Fortunately, most of us have never been in a war zone, never been in, in uh, some place where a lot of rioting is going on, so we don't really fully understand that, but we can envision it. But to the, the Jewish leaders had their own concerns about Jesus upsetting their positions and livelihood. See, the, the Romans allowed the Jewish religion to continue on. And in the sake of peace, they gave the Jewish leaders a lot of latitude. So they really lived a pretty cushy life within the, the Roman reign. And so for them, here Jesus is, they're, they're, he's possibly upsetting what, what they've got going on here. It's like, you know, this guy's, uh, guy's going to make it hard on us. We're, we're, uh, we're going to lose our nice benefits of being protected by the Romans and, and enjoying the, the nice lifestyle we live in. And, After all, if the people followed Jesus and his teaching, they would have been without power and authority, and that was more important to them than being true to the Word of God. Well, it's a different day, and the choice is the same. Listen, if you and I lived in or near Jerusalem at that time, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here. We would have been amongst the crowd hollering to crucify Jesus at the end of that week. 
that may seem unfathomable because we've got history to look back on. We have the finished work of the cross to look back on. They didn't. The people rejected Jesus based on human expectations and fear of perceived persecution. Some of that fear had a basis in reality. Understand that. It, it had a basis in reality. But some of it, and I wonder if most of it, was driven by the Jewish leaders that were, were bad-mouthing Jesus and saying, oh, you, you know, you follow him, you're out of the temple. You know, I mean, just throwing threats out there. The Bible account indicates the Romans didn't feel a bit of threat about Jesus. Matter of fact, so much so that he just kept getting bounced back and forth between two leaders on judging his faith. Because they're like, whatever, let the, let the Jews deal with this guy. He's nothing. The Jewish form of capital punishment, by the way, is stoning to death. Did you know that? Crucifixion was a Roman form of capital punishment, most horrific form of capital punishment ever instituted. And for the Jews to holler for him to be crucified was showing their allegiance to Rome. Ever notice that when Jesus came back to life, he didn't rebuke his disciples for leaving him? He also didn't retaliate against the Romans. He proved himself to be the true Prince of Peace. I would tell you that today many of us are afraid to take a true stand for, for Christ, for much of the same reason people did 30 AD. And a true stand rarely means being obnoxiously loud. Okay, that's really... You ever have a time when you were like, not sure if you should admit you're a Christian, you're among certain people or whatever. You ever have any situations like that? Maybe, maybe not. I know I did. I know I did one time. I was uh, working at this weld shop and we're talking to some of the roughest people I ever knew. I mean, we're, my boss was a cocaine addict and a bully, and I just rough language, all that kind of stuff. I would literally turn my radio down when I was pulling into the parking lot because it had Christian music on. I was that nervous. Okay, I, it sounds silly, but it, that was how nervous I was. And uh, I never thought about this bumper sticker that was on the back of my car for WCFL. And uh, uh, there was a guy who ran this really loud torch device and and I noticed that he was playing that radio station for several weeks and one day I'm walking by and he says he's looking around and he says hey man you know that radio station you listen to I said yeah he said did you know that's Christian music and all the noise he'd never actually heard the music I said yeah I did and he says man this is good stuff <laughs> I, he had never actually heard the words but he loved the music and and, you know, I got over my fear pretty quickly when I realized no one was going to beat me up for being a Christian. Uh, but that's just a perceived fear of persecution. And we live with that. And, well, taking a, a true stand, it includes having integrity in all areas of your life. That's sometimes difficult. Christians should be known for living a life that's different. And we should be known for honesty, for our work ethics, work ethics above reproach, I should say. That's not real common anymore. Um, certainly family ties that go well beyond the average. That's what Christians should be known for, not, not making big parades and yelling at people for their behavior. You know, some of the fear of persecution we face is based on reality of what we see in other countries because it does happen. Uh, 
doesn't really happen in our country too much. In fact, it's been said that in our country, Christianity has been ignored into irrelevance. And if we truly, if we truly embrace God for who He is and what He's done, persecution would not nearly be nearly enough to stop us from living for Him. I can't adequately describe what crucifixion was like. I can give you some overviews, and it was horrible. And uh, when you when you learn about it, you understand why some cultures are like, you have a cross as a symbol? It was uh, for, for the condemned, sometimes they were scourged, that was the case of Jesus. A special type of whip that would literally rip flesh right off of them. Most likely, when we see pictures of him carrying a cross, that's probably not historically accurate. Most likely, the upright post was already in the ground, but he was nailed to a, a cross beam that weighed roughly 100 pounds. Well, actually, he wouldn't have been nailed at that point. He would have been forced to carry it, though, after having been whipped. What a horrible, horrible start to a death. Then he was nailed to a cross. Crucifixion is very slow, painful, because you're slowly suffocating while you're hanging there. And, and so they would have to push themselves up to take more than just a shallow breath. And so with his feet nailed to the cross, he's pushing against that. <coughs> they were stripped completely naked to create as much shame as possible. This is what Jesus knew he was facing before he went to the cross. When we read that he prayed with great anguish, it's understood this wasn't a private execution either. This was fully public, and people had seen it multiples of times. It happened commonly in the, the Roman culture. Here's the thing. I wanted to talk a little more about this, and I'm going to now that I just say it. Jesus spent a night in prison before he was punished. Did you ever think about the three men on the cross that was with him? Or the two men, rather, that was with him? There were two robbers that were being crucified at the same time. And one of them asked Jesus to remember him. Did you catch that? Where did they hear about Jesus? I'll tell you, I think it was when he was in prison with them the night before. Fully knowing what he was facing, he still preached, tried to reach a couple more. That's there is nothing greater in the history of the world than Jesus' death and resurrection for us. And, and we can't minimize it. We can't just say, oh yeah, that was a historical event. So here's, here's what I would ask. Are you living to please and embrace the powers of this world or are you living for the kingdom of God? That's my big question from this message. When you, when you think about when you think about being a Christian, do you live in fear of perceived persecution? Or do you say, ain't nothing they can do to me that's gonna change it? As we go through this week before celebrating the greatest event in the history of mankind, which is the resurrection of Christ, consider if your actions are shouting, Hail Jesus or Nail Jesus. Think about that as you go through your day. And it doesn't matter what your past mistakes have been. The resurrected Christ 
is willing to love and forgive you. And the choice is yours to make. Amen? Lord, we, we truly cannot thank you enough for what you've done, sending your son down to, for us to pay for our sins in a, in a horrible way. But Lord, with absolute love and compassion for us at the same time. God, as we progress through this week, uh, I ask that our hearts and minds would be focused on what it means when we see a cross, Lord, that we would focus on what that really means for us and, and the, the freedom, the salvation we enjoy because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.